All right, it's Christmas time. Somebody shout Christmas time. Yeah, so we're going to be celebrating if there ever was a time that the world needs to be reminded of the message of Christmas. God knows it's now. In the midst of violence and war and all of that, this, we're living in a, in, a, in a mess. And yet Christmas is a reminder that Christ is in the mess with us. Tell somebody good news. Praise God. So would you please stand as we kick off this new series called Making Room. And uh, today I want to look at an interesting insight that's going to come to us through what I'm calling a Christmas shock unveil. Something stunning that will reveal to us an amazing insight that ought to be transformative in our lives. Everybody shout shock. Here's the passage, Luke 2, 7, King James Version, we kick off with. And she, Mary, brought forth her first son, her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And everybody shout amen. Amen. And amen. Please be seated. Over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to look at the invitation to make room through a variety of perspectives, all sharpened, if you will, by the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. And yet, the insights that we will be learning beginning today are insights that should not be merely limited to December the 25th, but as a matter of fact, these insights really ought to shape and inform our lives every single day of our lives. Tell the person next to you, make room. Make room. Make room. And when you hear this theme, making room, obviously you think about the passage that we just read in the New King James Version, this version I learned it in, which is uh, Luke 2, 7, where he says, And she, Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Now, just as an interesting tidbit, if you will, everybody shout, in. in. The word that's translated in could, in fact, be translated guest room because uh, if you look at the NIV version of that same passage, it essentially says, for there was, uh, no, room, there was no guest room available to them. So the suggestion is that more than likely, it wasn't that Mary and Joseph who had made a long trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And the reason why they made that trip was because there was a census on the way and and Joseph had to return to his hometown, the town of David, because uh, he wanted to be counted in the census. You will recall that uh, David is, in fact, King David, so there's royalty running through Joseph. So they hit back to Bethlehem, and Because it was crowded, the suggestion is they went to perhaps a relative's house, a friend's house. That person had a guest room and hoping that they could stay, but the guest room was filled. Now, in that day and time, oftentimes on the bottom floor of the house, there would be space created for the animals uh, that they could uh, be uh, protected, to come into a room to be protected. There's a feeding trough there, which we call a manger hay and all that. And so the suggestion is that probably they went there. But if you go to Bethlehem and you go to the church that is built over the site that is uh, designated as the birth of Jesus, it's actually a cave. Everybody say cave. So the suggestion is that actually probably what the reality was is that uh, there was the house that they went to and behind the house, the animals were kept and preserved in a cave. In either case, The question remains the same, doesn't it? 
When we hear about this notion there was no room for Jesus in the end, it begs the question for all of us, what are you, what am I doing to make room for Jesus in my life? Yeah. Is yeah. there any room for yeah. Jesus in your life? Or perhaps we say it in a broader sense, is there any room for God in your life? Ask the person next to you, is there any room? But I want to suggest this morning, as we look close at this text, that there is yet another insight that actually precedes, and I might even suggest uh, not only precedes, but, but is a greater priority, at least when you first hear it, that will uh, open us up to this notion of, do we have room in our lives for Jesus. This insight precedes that particular question which we want to look at. And this particular insight that I want to talk about today uh, precedes and supersedes. That's the word I was looking for. 59, I can't get all my words. <laughs> Somebody said, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, praise God. Uh, uh, so uh, this particular insight supersedes, if you will, this notion, this question, is there room? Because if we get this insight, making room for Jesus becomes kind of a no-brainer. All right. The insight that I want to talk about, check this out comes to us wrapped in what I call a Christmas scandal. Mm. All right. Everybody say scandal. Yeah. Scandal, scandal, scandal. Now we, we, in our culture, we have an affinity for scandals. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember a few years ago, there was a character named Olivia Pope. Y'all yeah. remember her? She was having an affair with the President of the United States, and, and, and uh, it was the most popular show in America. Uh, what was the name of that show? Scandal. 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 Something about scandals that attracts us, that gets us excited, the, 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 the elaborate version of what we call gossip. You know, scandal, something morally, uh, unseemingly or wrong that leads to public outrage or public surprise. And I want to suggest to you, you may not know, but, but, but just, just braided into the events around Jesus' birth are all kinds of uh, scandals. Yeah. Let me just identify three as I back into the point that I want to share with y'all today. Let me identify three. The first scandal, if you will, is really unveiled in Verse 5 of Luke of chapter 2, and here's what it says. And he, Joseph, took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, shall engage, who was now expecting a child. Now, if you know anything about this tradition of, uh, that Mary and Joseph was uh, in, uh, marriage was a multi-year process, an engagement marriage. Uh, and the very last phase of that process would require physical consummation, at which point the marriage would be uh, certified, if you will, and, and you'd use the term they're married. In this verse, we're reminded that the physical consummation had not taken place, therefore, they were not certified as married. The text says that they were engaged. Yeah. And then the text says, though they are engaged, that Mary is expecting. Yeah. And we know from the context that it was a visible expectation, if you will, because she was in her ninth month. Uh, uh, and so the question that the folk in the little town Nazareth was asking was, who's the daddy? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the question. Seriously, literally, that was the question that they were asking. And, and, and if somebody told them, well, 
well, you know, God did something and, 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 and she ended up pregnant. They didn't have no space in their thinking for that. They were like, come on now, come on. Come on, did I, 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 I may have woke up that night, but it wasn't last night. Come on. <laughs> Who's the daddy? Come on, there's one or two options. Come on, talking to gossip here, the scandal, the question. They say one or two options. Either Mary tipped out on Joseph, yeah. and he's such a cool dude that he's trying to cover. Yeah. Or Joseph and Mary were sexually involved before the appropriate time, which means that they both are, in fact, uh, uh, surrounded by shame and social shame and guilt yeah. Yeah. and scandal. Either way you slice it, come on now, Joseph and Mary making their way into the town of Bethlehem was a public scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody shout scandal. Yeah. Yeah. scandal. Another way to think about scandal is scandalous. Right. Can you say scandalous? Yeah. Scandalous, one way to think about it is when you take something that is super good and you attach it to something that is horrendously horrible to the extent that it also leads to public outrage and surprise. The next two examples that I'm working through is they're really scandalous. Look at verse 7b. We just read it. I want to revisit it again. She, Mary, wraps him, Jesus, in claws. That's poor people. Because back then, you're poor. You take those same strips that they would use to wrap the lambs in. When the lambs are born, they would wrap their legs to keep them straight. So you only had the claws like that. And interesting enough, Jesus would later be called the Lamb of God. Yeah. Uh, but you took the claws, the poor people, and you'd wrap the baby in it. And so they wrapped Jesus in the claws. That's what they had. And then they put him in a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. It's a feeding trough. Somebody shout scandalous. It's scandalous in this culture, cultural context because if you read Luke chapter 1 verse 32, when the angel visits Mary and tells her that she's going to conceive and bring forth a child, in verse 32 he goes on to say that this will be the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, or you can say it this way, of his ancestor, King David. It is to suggest, and Luke wants us to get this clearly, that the one that is being born and lying in a feeding trough is destined to be greater than the contemporary emperor who happened at that time to be Caesar's Augusta. And they were calling Caesar's Augustus the savior of the world because he had turned Rome into an empire. Come on now. But what Luke was saying is that the baby that is going to be, uh, that's born and laid in the feeding trough, that that one is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Now, shall scandalous. If he's noble as he was, if he's royal since he comes from the lineage of David, if he is designated to inherit the highest throne, then in that culture to lay a royal noble baby into a feeding straw wrapped with poor people cloths is scandalous. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's a third scandal, this event. This is the one that has the shock. This is the one that is most stunning. Perhaps personally for me because of my own experience, but I think it might have a stunning effect on you if you would dare lean in. Tell the person next to you, lean in. Verse 8. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, in order to understand this, you need the cultural context. In that day, when a king, someone who would ultimately be king, an emperor was born, at the birth, they would throw a big party, and everybody who was somebody was invited. And at the party, poets would write poems and choirs would sing songs. It would be remarkable. 
in this particular context, because the King of kings and Lord of lords is being born. The heavenly course comes from heaven, y'all. Yeah. But the scandalous thing is who's invited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell somebody, shepherds. Yeah. Uh, there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their frock at night. Now, we need to understand who these shepherds were in order to be grabbed by the scandal of the text. Everybody shout, shepherds. Collectively, they had no social or political status. They had no education. They had no wealth. Uh, always mixed in, often among the shepherds were criminals and people who had done atrocious things. Uh, uh, these were folk who you would not necessarily invite over to be a part of your Christmas dinner. These, the, the, these are people that you would not trust to be around your children. Uh, 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 stout shepherds. Shepherds, in many ways, they were tantamount to the unhoused community that surrounds us today. You know, the unhoused community is made up of uh, a variety of different people. Some are struggling with mental health challenges. Some are just the byproduct of having a hard time hit their lives. Some have just decided, you know, this is just what we want to do. This is how we want to live our lives so we get an RV and we're going to do it this way. There's a mixture of people in the unhoused community and, and it's very reflective of the shepherds of that day. And of course, they were nomadic and among them, they were often drifters in search of purpose. And in a book that is big on naming names, there are no names given to the shepherds. In a book that is big on, on, on identifying lineage, there is no lineage given to the shepherds. We don't know their name. We don't know their address. We don't know where they come from. We don't know their descendants. All we know is they are just what? Say shout, shepherds. They are the poster children, if you will, for nobodies. In that culture, they were nobody special, nobody important, nobody of note, nobody that anyone should be writing history about, nobody strategic to the unfolding of anything. And yet, verse 9 says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them. Oh, to the nobodies, y'all, <laughs> to the nobody special, to the nobody significant, to the nobody strategic, to the nobodies who are nobody important enough to give their name or their lineage, come on now, uh, to the nobodies where there are criminals and atrocities mixed in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The angel of the Lord appeared to them. If there are any nobodies in the house, you would be among the shepherds. Angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord. Oh, this is the favorite part here. Shout the glory. The glory of the Lord. Say the glory of the Lord. Glory. Uh, not the glory of, of Augustus, not the glory. No, this is the glory of the, of the Lord himself. Shout the glory of the Lord. The Lord. Shone around them, and of course they were the angel says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. All right, here's the good news that's wrapped up. Watch it. The good news that was wrapped up in the experience is this. God was saying to the shepherds that the birth of my son means that God has made room for you. Any yeah. nobodies in the house? Yeah. Any scandalous people in the house? <laughs> come on now, come on now, come on. Anybody who's count themselves out of history making process? Come on now. Yeah. Uh, 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 the text says that Christmas is of an announcement that says that, that, that before you and I think about making room for God, that God has made room for. When I was growing up, y'all know, I just, you, you just helped me celebrate. You know, I've turned 59, so the older you get, the more reflective you are. Yeah. So I'm thinking about this. This, by the way, is my favorite passage when I come to Christmas. If you've been around me, I preach it almost every year. I love it. I was thinking about why, why do I like it so? And I remember my mind drifted. And as a kid, preteen, 
in the Christmas play, whether it was at school or at church, I was always drafted to play the angel. I don't know why. Every year, they dress me up in that white sheet. They take some coat hangers and put some foil on it. They take some sparkling thing and put it on my head. And every year, they drafted me to play the angel. Sometimes, and then I had to learn the King James, vein, the K, KJV language, right? And so sometimes I was the angel showing up to Mary. Hell, thou who art highly favored. And I was always tripped out because the word is H-A-I-L, but it always sounded to me like I was saying H-E-L-L, you know? <laughs> The Lord is with thee. Come on now. <laughs> you are, uh, uh, oh Lord. And, uh, uh, sometime I was the angel in the text that we just read. And it'd be the King James Version when it says, uh, 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 Fear not, for behold, uh, I bring you good tidings of great joy that would be for all the people, right? And, and I kept getting kept, kept drafted. And I didn't like it. <laughs> and I didn't like it for several reasons. One, I had to learn the lines. But two, uh, in that day, my scars were enormously pronounced on my head, scarred kid. And so I felt ugly. I didn't like it because I also didn't feel good enough, partly because I had a horrible reputation that was well earned. <laughs> and not only was I shocked that they kept asking me to be the angel. Everybody in Cushada was shocked. Yeah, yeah. You gonna get Herman to be the angel? Yeah. Are you kidding? You couldn't find nobody that. <laughs> and the reality is, good people, the reality is this that when I would step out on that stage and the spotlight would hit me, come on now, all of a sudden, I would feel like my ugliness was on display. I would feel like uh, 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 the, the, the reputation that, 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 that was a horrible representation totally exposed me in that light, y'all, in the light. And I would feel like, listen, I was a scandal standing in the light. I didn't like playing the angel. And yet there is something marvelous about this text. And as I was reflecting, God, why you kept putting me in that situation? It was a, a, a subtle voice said to me, son, it was because I was trying to teach you at a young age that even with what you think was your ugliness, and even with what you knew was your scandalous reputation, I had already decided to make room for you. <laughs> I, I like this, y'all. I got to hurry, priest. I like this. I like this. I, I, I like this. Listen, 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 listen. If you go back to Luke chapter 1, I love who he elevates. You ought to read just the gospel of Luke. Because Luke pays attention to the poor. He pays attention to the marginalized. He shows how Jesus is uniquely interested. Come on. In folk that nobody else is interested in. Just read through Luke. Watch what I'm telling you. Now, uh, uh, in chapter 1, when, 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 when Zacchaeus uh, uh, is in the temple, that's where the story opened up. And his, he and his wife would ultimately be the parents of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. The angel shows up, and, and there he names himself he in verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, here's what it says. He says, uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared. Uh, is, he, he said, uh, the angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. Listen now. I stand as a norm in the presence of God. And I have been sent to you to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Now, we think it was probably Gabriel who led the course in the next chapter. But in either case, notice what he says. I stand in the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine standing in the throne room of God? Can you imagine? There's nothing but light there. 
Because God is the ultimate source of all light. That his glory, oh, y'all ain't listening to me, fills the space. And what Gabriel was saying is that I'm used to standing in the glory of the presence of the light of God. That's, that's my habitat. Well, keep that in your mind as you go and go back to the text I just read. Because there are some shepherds, y'all. And the text says that the angel of the Lord appeared to them. Watch it. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Oh, did you get it? Did you catch it? Did you catch it? That the same place where the angel stood regularly, God then created some space for the shepherds to stand in the same light. Y'all ain't listen. Oh, the shepherds and the angel in that text, they're sharing the same light. That's called grace. That's called mercy. That's called love. That's called Christmas, y'all. Yeah. God made room for the shepherds in his light. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. They didn't take a bath. They didn't get their record expunged. Come on now. None of that. They were just like they were, and he made room for... Oh, y'all ain't listening to me. Somebody shout, scandalous. Oh, but it's good news, isn't it? All right, all right, all right. Let me get to the... let Let me wrap this up in case you missed it. Christmas, the birth of Jesus, it's about... The announcement that whoever you are, however you identify yourself in modern culture, whoever you are, whatever your politics are, whoever you are, you may be a high schooler and you feel like isolated and nobody understands what's going on to you. There's a word for you. You may be a vet who feels like uh, your country lets you down and you stay at home by yourself because your family has isolated. There's a word for you. In this text, whoever you are, you may be single and, and, and you feel like marriage has passed you over. Whoever you are, you may be in grief and you feel like you're all alone in your grief. Whoever you are, I need you to get this point. This is the point. This is the point. God said to tell you today that he has made room for you. Yeah. 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 Amen. Celebrate that. That's good news. Y'all ought to celebrate that. Come on, don't, don't, don't do it too hard, but just tap the person next to you and say, that includes you. Come on, tap them. Somebody shout, how? How has he made room? Oh, I love the way you ask your questions. Three ways that God has made room for you. Uh, let me ask you, how often do you think that God thinks about you. How often, how often, Brother Hal, does God think about Brother Hal? How, how often, Dara, does God think about Dara? How often, young high schoolers over here, do you actually think God actually thinks about you? I mean, he's busy, right? He's managing the universe. He's in charge of creation. Sister Carol, how often does God literally spend time thinking about you? Being saturated with a thought about you? Well, the text tells us that first of all, God has made room for you and me in his thoughts. Look at the psalmist. Look what the psalmist says. And he tells us how often he thinks about us. He says, the text says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God. Somebody ought to be shouting right now. I'm just coming. Watch this. Watch this. How, say how often. Watch what he says. They cannot be numbered. I, I, I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. 
In other words, you just, you're just fixated on me. You're thinking about me 24-7. Not about how to judge me. Not about how to punish me. Come on. Not about how to get rid of me. Come on. Not to scold me. Come on. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm thinking. He's thinking about how to, how, how is it? How, how might he help his love to break through into your life? He, uh, he's created space for you in his thoughts, y'all. 24-7. He's thinking about you. Thinking about you. 24 7, he's thinking about you. If there's any shepherds in the house, it makes sense why they would show up and the angels would announce because it was God's way of saying, Listen, you just don't know it. You may be homeless and nomadic and without money and without educational status. Nobody in NBCC may even know your name. But I just want you to know, God says, I spend already eternity thinking about. So number one, he's made room for you in his thoughts. Number two, he's made room for you in his heart. Everybody shout heart. Ah, my favorite text, Jeremiah 31, 3. Here's what it says. And the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, and this is a revibrating re- statement that moves forward. It surrounds each of us. God says this. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you with an everlasting. Say everlasting. You can substitute that with, a, with, with, with outlasting. Say outlasting. Say, say, my love for you outlasts any tragedy you're going through. My love for you outlasts any brokenness that's in your life. My love for you outlasts, come on, any mistakes that you have made, any sinfulness that you've been. My love for you, I, my love for you is everlasting. I love you. That's why I think about you all the time because I love you so much. And you know what? You can't do nothing about it. So it says he's made room for us in his heart. That means he's made room for you in his heart, for all of you, whatever you are. Whatever defines your life. If you're going through grief right now, God says, I've made room for you. But that includes space for your grief and your tears. Come on, if you're confused and you've got questions about God, God says, I've made room for you plus your questions and your confusion. If you're lonely, God says, I've made room for you and your loneliness. If you're dealing with brokenness or whatever experiences that defines your life, God says, I've made room for you. And whatever those experiences are, that includes them too. I've made room for you. In my heart, God says. And then finally, he's made room for you in his thoughts. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. He says, I think about you guys. I'm focused on you. He's made room for you in his heart. He said, I love you. You just don't get it. That's why I sent my son into the world. to die Because I love you. And then watch this. He's made room for you in his plan. Ah, you know, I, 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 if you've been around, you know I, I recite this passage every Christmas because I love it so. Ephesians 1, 5, it says, God decided. Tell somebody God decided. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you ain't an accident, y'all. Come on. You, uh, you're not a cosmic mistake. God decided. Say, God decided. Christmas is not just a byproduct of some evolution that took place in history. Tell somebody God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself. Here's Christmas through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. Guess what? And it gave him what? Great. I don't know whether y'all heard Pastor Tilden's message last week. If you missed it, you need to go find it. It's on our website. It's, it's It's a brilliant message. And, and he made several points last week that is worthy. And one of the points he made I thought was fabulous. He said that often we think that we have to have joy before we can be grateful. But he says in reality what science proves is that being grateful 
is what leads to joy. And then he said, he talked about a sign, one of the great leading scientists at Stanford. And and we got some of our members who's had that person as a professor. They told him afterwards. But they said, this this professor has learned. The question is, well, how do I sustain my gratitude? And the professor has discovered that the way you do is that you focus on, watch this, the redemptive story. And the redemptive story is is the story of someone sacrificing all to save you. He said the person who wrote this is not per se a Christian, but my God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Shout redemptive story, (laughs) y'all. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Shout redemptive story, y'all. That's Christmas. Now, here's my point. Here's my point. Here's my point. Not only did God make room for you in his plan, but God planned room for himself in you. He built into the infrastructure of your neurological biology the need to hear and to represent and to recognize the Christmas story. That every time you hear the real Christmas story, your brain lights up. Y'all y'all ain't listen. That there was somebody born for shepherds, y'all. Somebody born to save shepherds, y'all. And to transform. All oh, right now, if you believe it, the lights in your brains are lighting up. And then he created space for you in his purpose. In other words, God made room for you. Okay, let me end it here. Somebody say, believe it. Believe it. Come on, you know, come on, shout it, believe it. Believe it. Come on, shout it louder, believe it. believe it. Come on, a little louder, come on, shout it. Believe it, believe it, believe it. Believe it that God has made room for you. Ms. Agoff, in his thoughts, God's made room for you. Pastor Jesse, in his heart, God's made room for you. In his plan. And there's nothing you can do about it. Shall I believe it? believe it? Believe what? Believe what the angel went on to announce. They said, uh, 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 the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem. Notice they didn't say a Savior. They didn't say a Messiah. They didn't say a Lord. Come on now. They said the Savior. They, 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 that was an announcement to people who organized their life around Augustus Caesar. It's an announcement for people who are looking to Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump for everything. No, they said, uh-uh, baby, come on now. All them folk going to die. But there is one who is the Savior. Y'all ain't listening. And his name is what? Jesus. Oh, my God. And the Messiah. That means the deliverer. And he doesn't just... Oftentimes we confuse God because we think, you see, he can deliver us from, and he does from time to time, from an addiction, from a problem. But more often than not, he delivers us through, through the storm. The Messiah, y'all ain't listening. And then the Lord, shout the Lord. That, that you know what that means ultimately? That means that death will speak and sickness speaks and trauma speaks and war speaks. But the one who is the Lord has the last word. And his last word is victory for your life. Yeah. All right, I'm going to end here. Did I tell y'all I did not like to play the angel? Yeah. But here's what I discovered. God specializes in turning shepherds into angels. Here's what I mean. An angel at best is just a messenger who announces good news. Gabriel announced good news to Mary. The angel announced good news to the uh, the shepherds. Uh, If you're one who will announce good news, come on out. He turns you into an angel. Let me show you. He turned the shepherds in the text into angels. Watch verse 11, 12. Watch what it says. They went on and they found Jesus. And then it says, after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. Y'all see that? And what the angel had said to them. The angel told them, now they're the angel. They're going out telling others. You know what I realized the other day on not too many days after my birthday? 
I'm still playing the role of an angel, y'all. <laughs> Every Sunday morning, I don't have no white sheet. I ain't got no fall on my back, but I'm happy to announce one who had a scandalous life, one who saw himself as ugly. I'm happy to announce because Jesus was born. God tells you he's made room for you, room for you, whoever you are, whoever you are, he's made room for you. Shout hallelujah. So I ended here. <laughs> if you're a shepherd, God wants to turn you into an angel. You just have to believe it. Well, now let me challenge you to go do what those shepherds did. I'll challenge you to leave this place today. And go tell somebody what the message was about. Yeah. High schoolers, go tell your mama and your daddy. Go tell your friends at work, at school. You know what I learned yesterday? Doesn't matter how bad you are. Because the preacher said he was pretty bad. That God made room for us. And that's what Christmas is about. And then I want you to go and invite them to come to NBCC. Tell them, I don't know and what you think about church. But there's no church like my church, y'all. Come on. And during the Christmas season, I want you to have some courage. I want you to have some angel gumption, y'all. We want you to come to check out our, my church. It's, it's made up of all kinds of people, y'all. Uh, uh, race and class, and different political views. We don't agree on all this stuff, all this lot of stuff. But we do agree on one thing. We agree that we are to love like Jesus loved. And we are all about making room. Oh, y'all. That's why we're so different because we make room for everybody. Go tell them. Don't be an angel. Go tell them. Jesus was born. Come check him out, y'all. Give God a hand praise. Shout hallelujah. I'm finished. Go ahead, Pastor. <laughs>